Good morning. This is Wednesday, June 16. Well, it just became afternoon. A class session, Math 264, Delta College, Introduction to Ordinary Differential Equations. So we're going to show you some very nice graphics today, I hope. And the idea is we are taking, let me make sure I got everybody in the room, people come and go. We are taking this slight detour into chapter five, just so you can have a nibble of chapter five, so you can see what can be done possibly in the future, but just two sections. Section one talks about the Jacobian, section two focuses on null clines. Really, you use them together. So I think in a sense, they're one section, there are two topics though. But then we're gonna to return to our main path and open up chapter four, forced harmonic oscillation. It's kind of a key, key topic. So, uh, yes, apart from the exam reminder, we're going to just jump right in. So, exam one released tomorrow by 11.59 p.m. And tomorrow is Thursday. June 17, so as soon as you hand in your other homework or about the same time you're handing in your last homework for this week, exam one due, just as the last time, Monday, June 21, the following Monday, since you're doing no homework, no new presentations over the weekend by 11.59 in our assignments folder. So you guys know that drill. Uh, tomorrow we're just doing some practicing on some questions and getting ready for the exam. I said in an email today, you know, focus, you know, work on a lot of problems in these first two sections in chapter five, which will make a lot more sense after the presentation today. But then if you still have questions about that, you can bring those questions on Thursday or email questions so that I put them in the queue so that they get answered on Thursday, even if you're not available for the Thursday session. So, oh, the only thing is this is exam two, not exam one. Good, I always have to correct something. And then we'll get this graded, return to you as we did the previous one. And then you'll have one more exam that covers sections in chapter four and appendix B and chapter six. So not every section of every chapter, not nearly, but the sections that we cover in those chapters. Okay, let's do an example where we show you the power of the null climb. And in a sense, we have talked about null clines a couple of times in this class. They've been in our Mathematica notebooks. You may have a feeling for what they represent, but now we're going to give you a formal definition. So I'm going to do this with an example. And then I'm going to bring images from the Mathematica notebook in that example. And uh, this will illustrate the use of null clines in the simplest possible way. And then you can address some more complicated problems. Your homework problem will be a, about one step up from that. I am trying to look exactly how I want this example to look. So let's write down this example. This is similar to exercise 5126. Not the same. First, I'm going to uh, simplify that exercise a little bit, and then we'll come back and look at actually the whole exercise. What I'm trying to do is decide where I want this to be what number I want to use on this. So let me just do a quick sketch 
on my other paper just to make sure I'm doing exactly what I want to do. So if that's that, that's that. Okay, let's go. So let's look at a first order system and we're gonna choose a relatively simple first order system, but a very important one. And I'm gonna give myself a lot of space from left to right because I'm gonna fill up the space right here and I'm trying to fit things in and make them readable. So here is the system. I'm also gonna color code some things. Hopefully I don't screw that up. So dx dt is x times minus x minus y plus 70 times the factor minus x minus y plus 70. Dy dt, let's let that be y times the factor minus 2x minus y plus 100. This is a little bit different than exercise 26. Exercise 26 has a parameter here, a number that's going to vary. And we'll do that. But first, I just want to look at a specific number. Okay, now this is a pretty mellow system. Each derivative is made of two factors. Each factor is a line. I mean, think about it like this. This is the line, you know, when is this equal to zero? When is dx dt equal to zero? Well, when x is zero or when the contents of this parabola is equal to zero. And if you say when the contents of that parabola is equal to zero, you say x plus y would be 70 because you set the contents equal to zero and you solve for x plus y equals 70. That's presenting the line in general form or y equals minus x plus 70. That's presenting the line in slope intercept form. But that's what I mean by this factor is a line. It's a linear factor. The same thing with this factor right here. When is dy dt zero? When y is zero or when this linear factor is zero? And this linear factor is zero when 2x plus y is 100. Take advantage of the minus signs. If 2x plus y is 100, then the opposite of 2x plus y will be minus 100, which will make this equal to zero. So I just am emphasizing when these two individually are equal to zero. Now an equilibrium point is when x prime and y prime equals zero. And in plain English, what is x prime? Change in the x direction. So an equilibrium point is when you have no change in the x direction, no change in the y direction, you're just sitting there. You're just sitting there at a dot. But you can abstract that slightly and get some benefits. To say x prime equals zero and y prime equals zero is demanding, right? It's demanding that you satisfy two conditions. But what if we looked at the conditions separately? So let's take a look at where x prime equals zero. That will mean I want to look at the places where there is no x motion, where there's no horizontal motion. That's the places that just have vertical motion. This is called any place where x prime is equal to zero, any curve where x prime is equal to zero. And when I say curve, I wanna be general and generous. It could be a line, it could be a circle, it could be any wavy thing in the plane. A curve where x prime is equal to zero, it's called an x null climb. And that's just a fancy way of saying no null inclination in X, no slope in X, no change in X. Likewise, 
a curve where y prime is equal to zero is a y null climb. And we've made this observation before. Together, if you have an x null climb meeting a y null climb, then you are at a point where there's no x motion, no y motion, then together they make an equilibrium point when they work together. But say this to yourself in English, no x motion, And y null climb means no y motion. No y movement, no x movement. Okay, so I've prepped you to examine this system to draw the equilibrium points and the null climbs. So first I'm gonna do this, which I don't often do in the paper because I'm not sure how well it shows up, but my intention is for this to be faint. My intention is for these marks to be light. So first of all, I'm going to draw in pencil, the so Y axis and the X axis. And that's relatively faint on your paper, but it's still visible. I want to make a note, and I didn't say that at the beginning. I should have said that at the beginning. In this problem, we are only going to look at positive x and y values. Well, greater than or equal to zero. We'll allow zero x and y values. So that's why this drawing is only in the first quadrant. Okay, now let's pop these four lines down. So where is the X null climb? Any place where X, the X dt is zero. So that means X equals zero or negative X plus, or my, negative X minus Y plus 70 is equal to zero. And that's the line X plus Y equals 70. Where is not Y null climbs? These are two Y null climbs when Y is zero or when this factor is zero. That means two X plus Y equals 100. Okay, so now I'm not talking about my scale. I'm talking about 70, I'm talking about 100. I'm gonna draw this scale accordingly. But, and, and I am looking at a mellow situation where I have four lines, but I want to differentiate between X null client, Y null client. I'll do that with color. So let's draw these two X null clients in red. X equals zero is the Y axis. Be careful about that. So now I'm adding color to that axis. I'll thicken it up a bit. Maybe I should thicken it up a little more. And X plus Y equals 70, think about that as a line where the intercepts are 70 and 70. So I'm gonna mark 70 and 70 on this mark, right? So every box should be worth 10. Well, then I gotta to go to 100 on the next box, right? So how about I make every box worth 20? And this is gonna be small. Maybe I should draw it larger. Maybe I will draw it larger in a second, but let's just consider this our first sketch. 20, 40, 60, 70. There's 70 on the y-axis. Here's 70, 20, 40, 60, 70 on the x-axis. And I'll draw a red line through that without moving my paper. Now, I'm not going to draw much more than the first quadrant because remember that's all we're looking at is the first quadrant. So there's the line x plus y equals 70. And I'm not trying to clutter this picture with scale. I'm not going to write 20, 40, 60, 70, but I'll put a 70 right there. 
You can put a 70 right there if you like. Okay, next step. Y null claims. When Y is zero, that's the X axis. We shade that darkly so you can see it. You can call this the X axis if you like. Maybe I should be neutral and call this the X axis in black, the Y axis in black. And then two X plus Y equals 100. Now the intercepts there are X equal 50 and Y equal 100. So you cover up the X, Y. So I draw this line, you draw it any way you like, but it's gonna cross at 100, 60, 80, 100 and 50, 70, 60, 50. Now let me draw that. You could say y equals minus 2x plus 100, so minus 2 slope, and intercept of 100. So let me just draw that gently, and then we'll darken it up. And we'll put down a label for the scale markers. Okay, good. So these are the X null clines and the Y null clines. And now, as we promised, wherever an X null cline meets a Y null cline, that must be an equilibrium point. So I want to identify this equilibrium point in black. I want to identify this equilibrium point in black. Here I want to identify this equilibrium point. I'm pretty sure I got this one. It's called zero, zero. So let's label these equilibrium points. Now this, remember, this intercept up here was 100 and this intercept down here was 50. So I need, I know that point too, don't I? That point is called uh, zero, 100. And now this point has got to be the intersection of the red line and blue line. So I'm gonna work on the red intersection of the red line and blue line. And if I take the blue curve minus the red curve, I'll let you find that intersection any way you want, but blue curve minus red curve will say X equals 30. I didn't quite show that well in that picture, does I? Blue curve minus red curve says X equals 30. So this black dot looks like it's more at 40 to me that's because my picture is not excellent. So if x equals 30, then x plus y is 70. Give me y equals 40. And double checking here. If x is 30, 2x is 60. 60 plus 40 is 100. So we've confirmed that this point is at 30, 40. So now here's my equilibrium points. Notice I have, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Got one over here, don't I? This must be the intersection down here. That equilibrium point is 70 and zero. Good, so I've got four equilibrium points. I could have found them by setting these equal to zero and matching them, but color coding the null clines is not a bad way to go. Uh, I don't think I have anything outside the first quadrant, so that's fine. Notice I did not put a dot where red line met red line because that's not an equilibrium point. Neither where blue line meets blue line. That's not an equilibrium point. Equilibrium point is when I have X null cline and Y null cline intersecting. Okay, good. Now I can run the Jacobian on these four points and I could find out the nature of the system at those four points. But there is another way. And I still haven't filled in these two spaces here. So let's fill in the first space. If I multiply this out, it has some value to me. And that value I'll show you, negative x squared minus xy plus 70x. Likewise for the dy dt, I write it in the order that pleases me, minus y squared minus 2xy, I'm not even crazy about this order, plus 100y. Now, what is good about the way I just wrote that there? That is easy for taking the partial derivatives, partial f, partial x, partial f, partial y, partial g, partial x, partial g, partial y. So this is 
to help me write the Jacobian. I don't want to differentiate this product. I don't want to execute product rules or anything like this. I want to see the polynomials so I can quickly execute the Jacobian. Maybe we'll do that below in a second. But don't disrespect this presentation. This presentation says what? Oh, quick identification of the null coins. So this presentation allows a quick identification of the null coins. And the equilibrium points because I can check out where the null clines cross. Well, if I got that and that, if I got null clines, I got Jacobian, I got equilibrium points, what do I need further? Well, what I need to do is to reveal to you the nature of this system. So let me do one more writing to show you the true nature of this system. So I should have written the minus xy and the minus 2xy on the end to make this more understandable. But watch as I factor out 70 times x from the first piece and the last piece. Well, from the first piece, that's, or from the last piece, that's easy. Remove 70 times x from 70x and you have a one. How about removing 70 times x from minus x squared? You say, well, you're crazy. You can't remove it. It's not there. There's an x, but there's no 70. Well, I can deal with that. Just divide by 70. Now, isn't 70x times this times this equal to the first piece and the third piece? Yes. This middle piece is tagging along on the end. I should have had it on the end when I wrote that the first time. Let's do the same presentation with the y's. Let's factor out 100y. And that leaves a one in the third piece. And that leaves a minus y over 100 in the first piece. And then this minus two xy on the end. This third presentation, now this is in a way overkill, right? But it's, it's how you should think about problems, looking at them to reveal their secrets, looking at them to reveal their qualities. This is a qualitative analysis. This presentation tells me that I have what? Two species X and Y that both tend to grow, both have a carrying capacity, and both suffer from the presence of the other. In plain English, these are two competing species. Not one species preying on another, like eating another, but two species like, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a biologist, you know, cod and mackerel, you know, cod don't eat mackerel, mackerel don't eat cod, at least I hope not, or else I'll be representing this badly, but they probably eat the same plankton or something, right? Don't make fun of my biology examples. Lots of, it could be two plant species in your garden, right? both grow, but if one grows, that invasive species grows too far, it crowds out the other. Or if one grows too far, it crowds out the other. So there's a competition here. Both naturally grow, but both don't like the other to be present. And so this is, we want to find out who wins. In a way, we want to find out who wins. Now, this model is famous model. It's called, it's presented in your book, also in section 5.2.
the Volterra Latka system. for competing species. And why is it famous and why did these people earn their names associated with it? Well, because in a way it is the simplest possible way to represent competition of species. And we'll see as we go along. You've heard a phrase in the sciences called Occam's razor. You know, can you, can you vocalize what Occam's razor means? It means, if you're trying to understand a phenomenon and you have two or more explanations for the phenomenon that seem to be legitimate, what do you always favor? You always favor the simpler explanation until it fails and you need to get more complicated. But you always favor the simpler explanation because Number one, it's easier to analyze. And number two, it's, it's possibly, quite possibly, closer to nature. Now, nature does have a lot of complicated things in it, right? But even among the complicated systems in nature, we try to find the simplest possible presentation of the complicated systems. So you didn't think of this as competing animals. You just thought of it as a differential equations problem. Now I tell you, it is the common model for two competing species. And that's why it was represented you know, in honor of those two people. Now, I'm gonna write the Jacobian with this writing. That makes it easy on me. I drew the Noclines with this writing and I'm gonna come back and still use those. But in the third presentation here, now I know what I'm talking about. It wouldn't have made much sense for me at the very beginning to say, oh, these are two competing species. You wouldn't say, like, how does he see that? But you see it here in the carrying capacities, in the growth, and in the detraction from growth here. Okay, now we need to make this picture bigger. We also need to reach into our bat utility belt and write down the Jacobian, right? The 1960s television show, Batman, Adam West, always Batman had the right tool on his utility belt for the moment. So what's Jacobian? Let's just write it down here in case we need it later. It's partial F partial X, which is minus two X minus Y plus 70. Partial F partial Y is simpler, it's just minus X. Partial G partial X is just minus two Y. And partial G partial Y is minus two Y, minus two X plus 100. A little bit cramped right there. Okay, so I'm just assembling the tools I'm gonna to need. So this much you could have done without too much coaching. Now the next step in using null clients is a place where you have to be careful and that's why I need a larger picture. So yeah, this is, here's another issue. When I highlight things and try to make lines darker then it bleeds through to the next sheet. So I don't necessarily appreciate that, but I'm gonna make this picture bigger. Uh, I'll keep this picture up here for a reference for a second, but it's hard to make a big picture and have the other one present. Yeah, let's just make a big picture. Okay, so I'm gonna draw the giant y-axis, enough to accommodate that scaling of one box equals 10. And I'll draw a giant x-axis in blue. I don't think I'm going to shade these darkly because I don't want to bleed through. And then let's get my scaling in here, like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100. And then another point at 
10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. So I must have counted wrong. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. But that's 70, then 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. 100 up here. Okay. And then the other key point was 70, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. And the other key point was at 50. Now this is going to help me because this line had a slope of minus 2. I can go steps like that. This line had a slope of 1 minus. There's my 30, 40 intersection point, which we'll fill in a second. OK, now I'm going to draw lines the way all normal people draw lines, and that is shift the paper so I can draw nicely. But then I'll bring it back and put it upright for you. Sorry. Why aren't we doing this on a computer, you say? Uh, we will, but first I want to build up your intuition. Do a little bit of darkening. Then I'll make this upright so you're not so dizzy. OK, now, and some scales. 70, 50, 70, 100. Uh, you see where the intersection points are, but I am not going to write numbers on those yet. I don't want to over clutter this drawing. What I want to do now is focus on the motion in the drawing. So these are the null clients, but now we add direction. And that is, let's take a look at this. Let's pretend, and I'm going to have to bring back my system to do this. I'm going to fold this paper and bring it back at the top of this. Let's pretend we drew little direction arrows on each of these lines. Remember the red line is the X null clients where there's no X motion. That means there's only Y motion, up, down, Y motion. So let's think about what happens on this vertical red line. Now pay attention, this vertical red line has the X dt equal to zero because the vertical red line is X equals zero. So I've said x is equal to zero now by covering it up with my pen. I also have an x right here. So when x is equal to zero, this piece is gone. Then what do I have? Just y and 100 minus y. I don't have this term over here on the end, just y and 100 minus y, the capacity at 100. So if you check the direction out, y and 100 minus y, between zero and 100, that means direction up. So without the other people, this species would climb to its capacity of 100. If it was above 100, it would fall to its capacity of 100. Let's do the same thing on the horizontal blue line. It's hard to manage two pieces of paper at once. On the horizontal blue line, y is 0. And when y is 0, dy dt is 0. That's what it means to be a y null climb. So dy dt is 0. But now let's let y be 0 right there. Now this is x times 70 minus x. What does that say? That in the absence of y, this x species would climb to its capacity of 70. And if it was above its capacity of 70, it would fall. Okay, that's so far so good. But now I can do the same logic on these two lines. Remember 
on the blue line, there is no Y motion. That means I can only go left or right on the blue line. How will I indicate that? Well, first of all, let's put a horizontal dash on that blue line, both pieces. I could put multiple horizontal dashes, but I don't want this drawing to be too cluttered yet. We can add more horizontal dashes later. Now I got to decide in this space, am I going left or right? In this space between these two black dots, am I going left or right? Let's think about this logically, or you could test a point. You could physically test a point like 2060 on the blue line. First of all, let's test the point 2060. I picked nice numbers on the blue line. What is the Y motion? Zero. Did I say that correctly? No, 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 no. Yes, because 20 for X makes minus 40. 60 for Y makes minus 40, makes minus 60. That makes minus 100. Right, no Y motion. Oh, got it. Let's put 2060 in here. Then I get negative 80 plus 70 is negative 10. And sitting there with 20, this is a negative number. Okay, what did I just discover? On this line segment, my motion is left. Now I could do the same test here. I could test at 40, 20, but I could also say this. Let me show you a different way to do this arrow. Now check this out. This red line is X plus Y equals 70. Now if you test carefully, below the red line should be X plus Y less than 70. And if X plus Y is less than 70, this is negative. Uh, did I say that correctly? I hope I said that correctly. Yes, well, let me say it now, I gotta say it more carefully. If X plus Y is less than 70, that's below this line, then these two people do not overpower the 70. The 70 is bigger, the 70 is stronger. This piece is positive. I should have said that piece is positive. And that makes me go to the right. You could also test a point. Now, let me do one more drawing. Let's look at the red line. The red line is an X null cline. That means no X motion. That means I can only go vertically. So I put two little vertical lines on there. And my decision now is, am I going up or down? So I could test a point like 1060 on the red line. That gives me zero because that fills in the 70 exactly. Here, 1060 gives me minus 20, minus 60, minus 80. 100 is bigger, that's positive number. And 60, positive number there. dy dt would be positive, that is going up. And likewise here, dy dt would be negative. I'll do that with the other argument. So on this blue line, 2x plus y is 100. But if you go above the blue line, you have to check this because you have to watch the signs of your variables. 2x plus y is more than 100, right? So if 2x plus y is more than 100, then this negative stuff wins. And this piece is negative. So positive y negative term here, that means I'm going down. Now I got a massive win. Pretty massive win. Let's check this out. I could do more arrows, and I'll show you a picture in the book where he had room to do more arrows. But let's see what this did to my plane. Remember, this is the Y species, this is the X species. What these two lines did, what these two red lines and the two blue lines did, is cut the fourth quadrant into four sections. And let's just casually call them in our little sub drawing up here, A, B, C is gonna be in there and D is gonna be in there. I want to not clutter this drawing. Well, you just learned a great deal about this system. For example, 
if you have a solution that begins in region C, what happens to it? It's being pushed up and left. Any boat that starts in region C must be driven upwards and leftwards until it reaches that equilibrium at 0, 100. You say, you're biting off quite a bit there, Dave. No, I'm not. If I put a boat right there, it can't cross this red stream because this red stream drives it completely up. It can't wander over into region B because on this whole wall, I'm being pushed left. That dot cannot cross any of these borders. It can't go down across this red border because I'm being pushed up there. So any solution there is being pushed into the equilibrium point. So this is a region C where I cannot escape. Likewise, the region D cannot be escaped. Anything inside D has to drive to that equilibrium point. Now inside A and B, there's gonna be some choices. If you're a person inside A, you could, well, you're gonna be driven outward in both directions, but you could go up, 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 cross this line vertically, you have to cross it vertically, and then curl in towards the equilibrium point. I'm doing this in black. If I traced backwards, maybe I came from way down here. But if I had started the boat here, what am I gonna do? Drift, 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 cross the blue line horizontally, and then be driven into the equilibrium point. Now, remember what I'm doing right now is a qualitative analysis. Not, I don't know the equations of these black lines. Or if I started up here, maybe I would drift over, come horizontally across the blue line like that, and then come down to that point. But notice if I cross the blue line, I must cross horizontally. And if I cross the red line, I must cross vertically. Likewise, if I was over here, I might drift down to that equilibrium point, cross this blue line horizontally, and then be driven to the equilibrium point, come down, cross blue line horizontally, driven to equilibrium point. But if I'm a little further down in this region, I would drift downwards. Why would I drift downwards? because the pressure in the X direction is negative and the pressure in the Y direction in this region is negative. So I'm gonna drift downwards, cross vertically and head to equilibrium, possibly closer. Drift downwards, I don't know at what angle really yet until I pull out a computer, cross vertically, go to equilibrium. Notice if I had released a boat way over here, I am gonna go down and to the left, but maybe I don't get to cross that red line, right? Maybe I just drive straight to the equilibrium point. And it could be likewise if I released a boat up here. Maybe I'm driven directly to the equilibrium point. I don't know if I can make that judgment yet, right? I need a computer to test that out. I need my numerical solutions. But what do I have? I have a strong feeling that I understand this system. I have a strong qualitative understanding of the system. In fact, this is a phase portrait. Do you see phase portrait? It has the equilibrium points. Make sure you put this in every phase portrait the black equilibrium dots where there's no motion. It has all straight line solutions. It has samples of other solutions. And you see that I skipped Number three, need a special color. Uh, let's go with pink. Uh, pink might be close to red. Orange might be close to red. Uh, 
Let's go with pink. One more vocabulary word. And we've used this word maybe once casually, but haven't explained it. Look at these two curves that peel off this point. By the way, all solutions are peeling off this point. There's a strong bet that that's a saddle, right? That's a strong indication that that's a saddle. Our Jacobian will confirm it in a second. But what if I could just split the difference between those solutions and crawl right up to there and not being driven left or driven right? You know, it's entirely possible that there would be a solution that goes to that hair trigger equilibrium that these two species could coexist at that hair trigger equilibrium right there, that saddle. It's possible, but it'd be very hard because at that point then any change would drive them left, right, up, down. This curve that just drives into that saddle point is called a separatrix. Separate tricks, plural, separatrices. So I've got two curves diving into that point, but likewise, since it's a saddle, I have two curves diving out of that point. And what do they separate? They separate the curves coming from below from the curves coming from above. And it's neither on the blue line or on the red line. It's probably in between the blue line, and the red line, and it heads towards that sink. Oh, that looks like a sink. Possible sink at 70, zero. And there'll be a separatrix here. Well, now do you see that it's possible that I've over cluttered this drawing? My face portrait is a little bit over cluttered when I include those four separatrices. Separatrices are solutions that come into or out of a saddle because they carve up the plane. Now the blue straight line solutions also carve up the plane. The null clines do not carve up the plane. The null clines look for flow. <coughs> but my black, red, and blue arrowed things, where the arrows are along there, those are solutions. Where the arrows are crossing the null cline, those are not solutions, those are direction indicators. And that's since I have too many arrows. Okay, now, before we take a break, now we can pull out the big guns. And that is, let's look at this represented in a Mathematica notebook. But do you see, and I said this comment once before, I should say it again. What good is the notebook, the Mathematica notebook to me, the big gun, if I don't have a feeling for what's happening? Now I could use my Jacobian right here to confirm that that's a saddle at that point. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe you should do that. But I need a feeling to see if I'm going to be right. So I'm going to open up a notebook. It's on our website. It's called, oh, it's, maybe it's not on our website. I have a notebook. Maybe I'll have to add it to the website that specifically does 5126. Let me open it up, I'll share it with you. And then later, I think I'll have to add it to the website in case you wanna play with it. Because this notebook has an extra special feature. Okay, let me open it up. Let's take a look at it. Let me make sure you see what I see. Let's share it. Got it, go, good. Okay, so I'm going to pump up those words a little bit higher. So you can see it, I think you can see it. What you can see right here is I did write exercise 26 of section 5.1 in there, but notice with one difference, I changed the A of the 100 to an A. Let's go back to my paper for a second. What is the significance of these flow lines? Well, they really tell us which species wins. For example, if I end up at 70 and zero, and species X is at 70, species Y is at zero, in this half of the space, species X wins, species Y, I'm sorry, goes extinct. 
But on this half of the space, everything goes to zero 100 species, y goes to 100 species, x goes to zero species, y wins. The separatrices are what? In, in these two separatrices coming into that saddle tell you the borderline between who wins. Because if I put equilibrium, if I put a dot there or there on either side of that separatrix, it only seems like a tiny difference. But on one side, species Y dies, the other side, species X dies. So I added this number 100 to the problem. What if I got fancy and checked out the carrying capacity of species Y? Let's monkey with the carrying capacity of species Y, because that playing with the carrying capacities might determine who wins and who loses, who has enough space. So that's what this notebook is about. So I replaced the 100 with an A, a parameter A, and then I built that into the functions F and G. You could say there's no reason to build it into F, I understand, but I was just trying to be uniform. For the K, I'm gonna make a window size that's big enough to display all this, like minus 160 to 160. Uh, technically, I think I'm gonna go zero to 160, but we'll see. It's gonna be an adjustable window. Okay, now let's create some streamlines, field and null clients, but I'm doing this different than I did it before. Usually I said the streamlines is a variable, but do you see here the streamlines is a function that depends on A. The field is a function that depends on A. The null clients is a function that depends on A. What am I doing? I'm setting up an animation. So you, you need time to study this independently. I've got my equilibrium points marked and they are function animation Y null clients. Let's really pump this up. I don't think I've featured this command with you before, manipulate. I've used the command show to put together multiple drawings. But manipulate, when you take the show command, there's the show command. That's boring. But I wrap it in a manipulate command. And now I'm going to create an animation with a slider called A. Now, I gave it the word manipulation, right? So I'm not ready. Notice the set delayed here. So I'm not displaying anything until I call the variable manipulation. Here's the variable. Let's not spoil the fun. Here's the variable manipulation. Let's execute the variable manipulation. Or let's ask Mathematica what that variable looks like. The variable looks like an animation. Now I'm gonna turn on the animation tools. Right now A is set to zero. Let's set A to 100. Oh, that's the drawing I had a second ago. My 30, 40, my streamlines showing one system winning or losing. Now, if I wanted to get, if I wanted to bring in the field here, I could bring in the field. But the problem with bringing in the field here is this is going to get too cluttered. Maybe I should only show the field. Let's comment out the streamlines for a second. Oh, there's my field. Well, those arrows look a little bit crumbly and on top of each other, right? But let's set that A equal to 100 with a slider. Oh, do you notice that as I do the slider, the arrows reposition themselves? This is a powerful weapon in mathematics. It's called manipulate. I don't like these arrows. I think I'll go back to the streamlines. I want to show you some features here. I'm going to go over our top. Okay, did I not? 
Let me make sure. Yes, yeah, somehow I've been turned off from that. So let me show share again. My fault. Okay. I may have goofed that up. So input the system, create functions. And now I'm going to manipulate the system. And maybe I resized the window and that caused a problem. Okay, let's look at this manipulation with the streamlines again. There we go. Look at this. Let's let A be 10. What's going on with this species with a capacity of 10? Well, they're losers. They're total losers because they're not going to, the other species are just overwhelming them. Let's increase that capacity to 50. Oh, okay. So now species Y is putting up a fight. But uh, still in the end, species X wins. See, all the solution curves are going to 70, zero. In fact, when is this going to get interesting? It's when that black dot goes above 70. Let's make it 100, like our calculations. Now I got a contest. Now I got a contest that says it's possible that species Y could win, depending on where I am in this picture. Now let's pump this way up. When would species X start to lose totally? When this line crosses the 70, probably. So let's make this crossing place 80, which is a slope two, makes this a 160 up here. And let's go. Yes, in this situation, species Y wins. Species X has absolutely no chance. No matter how low Y starts, species X has no chance. But why did we call this animation? Because we can animate it. Now, I got two problems going on. First of all, I'm transferring video to you, which makes this not excellent. Let's turn on the animation going forwards and backwards so I can talk about it. So transferring video to you is a little bit costly. That's why this looks jerky. The second reason this looks jerky is because Mathematic is calculating things on the fly. Makes it look a little jerky. Let's slow it down. Relax, slow down. OK, now it's slowing down. And you see that with the wrong carrying capacity, species Y has no chance. But if I have a carrying capacity above that intersection of two red lines, then species Y starts to do what? Has a chance to win. And this saddle point travels down that red line. It's the border, but it travels down the red line until it eliminates the X species. Uh, I could go even slower. Notice if I stop, then Mathematic, it gives me a filled in picture. Mathematica's engine catches up to the calculation and it fills it in. Watch that again. I'm rolling. I stop. When I stop, Mathematica fills in more curves, more pleasant view. I could also step forward one tick at a time or step backwards one tick at a time. That allows me some control. And I've gone over the half, I've gone over the hour, but this is going to be worth it. Just give me a couple minutes here. One more total weapon. So now notice this manipulation that I created was a manipulation with just one parameter A. I could create a manipulation with two parameters. I could do that problem from 3-7 with the matrix with the A and the B. Oh, this opens up lots of doors. So manipulate command is a very powerful command. So here's a demo. Now I want to do one more thing for you. And this is kind of Mathematica techie stuff. So don't worry about it because I don't think it's going to work too well. But because you guys have an operating copy of Mathematica on your computers, that means I could share this with you. 
so that you could operate this animation by yourself. And in Mathematica, that's a special command called cloud deploy. So if I take my manipulation and wrap cloud deploy around it, then Mathematica comes back to me with a URL. And this URL would be a URL to the Mathematica animation that you can open in your browser. I'm gonna paste this into the chat window. Now the problem is, you know, what browser are you using, et cetera, et cetera. So Cloud Deploy's got limitations. But Cloud Deploy created this cloud object, it's kind of like a Google Drive thing. It's kind of like a little animation inside of Google Drive, but it's in a Wolfram Drive. And I'm gonna stop sharing, pop this into the chat window. And while we're taking a break, you guys could follow that link, see what happens. I don't see, see little quotation marks around it. Okay, but it is an actual link. You could click that hyperlink and see what happens. Okay, you've been patient. This is excellent, but this is a great example. And let's, we're into break. So let's say 105, 106, let's call it 111. This is section 5.2 and 5.1 kind of combined to give you superpower over a simple but still sophisticated system. Okay, I'm gonna hit my mic while I stretch my legs. You can do the same. I'll be back in a few minutes.
Okay, we're back. Uh, if anybody tried out that link, you can report to me in the chat what you see. I mean, I know what I see if I follow the link. Uh, I'm curious, you know, maybe you say, oh, browser doesn't have plugin or something like that. I don't think that you need a plugin. You know, plugin is kind of old school. So, you don't want to add something to your browser. I think that this basically, this animation basically goes to Wolfram's cloud servers and just communicates back and forth between the cloud servers, which makes the animation a little bit slower. So maybe if you did execute it, it executed, but in kind of a jerky way but it still gave you some possibility to play with it with your own hands. Okay, now next. So this is a really important model, but I want to disavow you of a notion. Null clines do not have to be lines. And this is what you're going to encounter in your homework. A null cline is literally just a curve. So I could show you an example where the colliding curves are not lines. And I'll do that for you now in an example that looks like 5, 1, 5, 1, 24. And I have 5, 1, 24 solution posted. I think I have this Mathematica notebook in my Google Drive. I just don't have a link to it yet, but it links to the Google Drive. So let me quickly check out my Google Drive here to, for this problem, 5126. Let me just make sure. And then I'll show it to you. Hmm, I do not have that exercise in there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it up there right now and then show you where you can go get it. So I'm gonna exit the Mathematica notebook. I'm doing this off screen. I'm going to upload that Mathematica notebook to the Google Drive. I run a lot of things off Google Drive in case the school servers are not working someday, which once in a while happens, but not too often. Here's that exercise 5126. Got it, uploaded, then I'll come and show you where it is, even though it's not on my website listed. Okay, so remember, now I'm gonna share a screen with you. The Mathematica notebooks are listed here. I could create a link to that notebook I just worked with you on. But these links just take you to a Google Drive. So if I click on one of these links, I'll go to the Google Drive and you can still find that notebook. Let me expand this window. Let me go to list view. Let me get rid of the ad. Here's the list view of the contents of that Google Drive. So you see notebooks we've been working with. You've already looked at some of these. There's our exercise 5126. So you can download that and play with it just like I did right there, even though it's not listed on our website. So I do have a few extra notebooks. You have to download it and open it. I do have a few, I'm not gonna do that right now. I do have a few extra notebooks in here, you know, that I, Upload, download, correct, change, whatever. Okay, let's go back. So you can access Mathematica notebooks. Any one of these goes to the Google Drive. And then you can search for that notebook that you're interested in, but I should name it here so that you remember it. I don't think that's such a big deal, so why don't I just do it? Copy. Got it. So I'm off screen again. 
least. Got it. Change this to exercise. O five, O one, two six. MB. I'm going to put that there. Copy it likewise to the resources page. Good. Upload both of these. Good. And now take you back to that website. I got to get back to the same website. If I reload this page, there it is with a broken link. So that's why you don't do these things live. <laughs> Okay, fix broken link. I think I did that correctly. Fix broken link on next page. Save, save, upload. So you don't do website maintenance in real time. Okay, so there's that exercise if you want to look at it. I want to show you one more though. I want to show you the one above it called nonlinear system bifurcation, just to emphasize that no clients could be any curves and let you see a beautiful result. So let me open up the notebook, nonlinear system bifurcation. You can get your own copy, but I'll do it here on my desktop so that I don't wait for things to download. I have my own copy down here. And then I'm going to share it with you. Got it, got it, got it. OK, here we go. And I'm going to pump up the words. There. So here I want to show you bifurcation in another context. So this is a problem from 5.1, exercise 24 5.1. Solution is posted on our website. But notice this time I have parameter A twice in the system. And let's just think about this generally. Y minus X squared plus A is a parabola. If you set it equal to zero, you get Y equals X squared minus A an opening up parabola. Bottom one, y plus x squared minus a. If you set that equal to zero and solve for y, you get y equals minus x squared plus a, opening down parabola. So you have a feeling for what this looks like, but let's get the visual. So let's execute this. I'm just interested in the visual. I'm not interested in the commands right now, but I showed you that I created a function to give me streamlines for every different value of A. I've got some special points marked here. Field, null clients, stuff. Now I'm worried about variable collision, variable name collisions here, but we're gonna have to wait and see what happens. Here comes the manipulate command, showing streamlines as they vary with A, field as it varies with A, null clients as it varies with A, and equilibrium points as they vary with A. Let's see what happens. Okay, this is what I wanted to see. You see two faint parabolas in there. I guess I could darken them up. You see field arrows and you see flow lines. So I think that's too busy. Let's get rid of the streamlines for a moment. Comment them out. Now let's look at those field lines and let's move the parabolas closer together. Oops, too close, they crossed. But let's look at those parabolas carefully. 
Remember, one was in the dx dt and one was in the dy dt. So one of them is an x null Klein, no x motion, only vertical motion crossing the parabola. The other is a y null Klein, no y motion, only horizontal motion crossing the parabola. Notice in this region on the outside, x is always going down outside the parabolas. Y is always going up outside the parabolas the x component, the y component. Notice inside here, the y component is going up above the first parabola, the top parabola, but the x component is reversed and is going to the right. Notice here, the x component is always going left in the lower parabola, but the y component reverses and goes down instead of up. So now I want you to think of this as a wake of two boats or some collision of particles in a stream or a field and watch what happens as I change this A. No equilibrium points because no null clines have met. But now the null clines meet and I create two equilibrium points and I got turbulence or swirling going on. Let's see what the swirling looks like. On the left, the swirling looks like avoidance or bouncing off, possible saddle. Sorry, that's on the right, my right, your right. On the left, it looks like swirling around in a circle. Is it sink, is it source, is it spiraling? Possibly. Bring this up higher. Now I still got some saddle avoidance on the right. On the left, I'm not sure if I'm still spiraling. I might have a straight line solution in here somewhere. But the field is hard to read, right? So let's turn off the field and let's turn on the streamlines. Let's comment out the field. And uncomment the streamlines. Mm, I've got a comma screwed up somewhere. Gives me an error message. I'm going to look at the error message. Streamlines A cannot be followed by null cleanse equilibrium points. So is it angry because I left out a comma? There's nothing wrong with that. Let's take out the commenting. Must have had something out of place. Okay, now it's functioning. Let's just take out field the old fashioned way. Okay, that's better. Now I've got my parabolas and my streamlines. And watch what happens as I bring the A's closer together. Whoops, too far. Notice all streamlines cross the upper parabola vertically. I don't have too many here. All streamlines cross the lower parabola horizontally. So what happens when that vertical motion crashes into this horizontal motion? Watch what's happening at the origin. Do you see how things want to be horizontal? But as soon as, because they approach the lower parabola and they want to be horizontal, but as they approach the upper parabola, they want to be vertical. So there's a contest going on here. If I just increase A slightly, And I'm gonna do that one step at a time. There's gonna be an accident. When these two parabolas get very close. Now this is a error in the Mathematica program, but here's the accident. Now it's not an error, but it's a very small number. I'm gonna change it to zero. There's my equilibrium point, And here's this problem that I got all these flow lines pinched. Remember the bottom parabola wants to make things horizontal. The upper parabola wants to make things vertical. And as I go forward and go into two equilibrium points, that pinching, notice how it's almost like a uh, 
UK system right here at the origin. I could bring back the arrows and show you because things appear to be going parallel back and forth. But as I go forward, get some more separation between those points. Look at, I clearly start to see saddle action on the right and spiral action on the left. Let me go forward a little more aggressively. It's definitely spiral action on the left, saddle action on the right. Let's go forward a big chunk. Now it's much more obvious. Now, if I go to for watch the spiral on the left, the thing on the right always turns in is always a saddle. But this thing on the left, I think, as I go farther along, separates. It's more of a straight line. Uh, it's more of a almost spiral source or something. So right now it's a spiral source, but I think it's going to drive through spiral source. Let's slow down. Let's let it run. Right there, I think it's an almost spiral source or pretty close to an almost spiral source, almost like a straight line here. And as I increase, I mean, we'd have to do some calculations to find out. But do you understand what we're doing? We're getting intuition to tell us where to calculate. I'm gonna drag this farther over quite a bit. Yeah, clearly still saddle over here but I'm thinking this could be an almost spiral source going on right here, or maybe even a traditional source with two very close streams. Get it all the way out here like that. Now, why did I have so few streamlines? Because I cooked this example. Up here, I chose just a handful of streamlines. How many streamlines did I choose? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Why did I choose eight streamlines? Because I wanted to show you the saddle action. There's four streamlines. And I wanted to possibly show you the spiral action and maybe a straight line solution here, but we didn't come across it. You see four streamlines. You see some of these streamlines came over to the other place and bounced off. Okay, the, oh, notice by the way, that on the downward opening parabola, you are still crossing horizontally. And on the upward opening parabola, you are still crossing vertically. So those are the null climbs. That's a lot to examine. You gotta kind of play with that yourself. So that's on our website, you can play with that yourself. Okay, we've gotta go to someplace else now. You gotta open up chapter four. So that is, so I want you to also see also nonlinear system bifurcation notebook. in the Google Drive. So you want to play with those notebooks just so you have a feeling for how things work. And uh, I do not want, your homework problem does not have animation. Your homework problem is going to be a still, like this is a still single image. I'm not having you introduce a parameter in your homework problem. But you can still use some of those notebooks to execute the images there. Okay, you could use the you could use those notebooks to give you a nice image. You should try to draw your image by yourself too, and then confirm it with a notebook. Okay, now we return to our main path. All right, get our paper, move up, oscillation.
or you could say vibration. Isolation is the more scientific word here. <coughs> Chapter four. Okay. New paper. We're going to introduce this for several minutes now. And then we'll do some more examples next time. So we have two representations of our damp harmonic oscillator. One is where the spring and the damper are fixed against a wall. This is my double prime plus by prime plus ky equals zero. So the acceleration of the mass is strictly due to the damping force of the damper and the restoring force of the spring. No other force is involved, so these things sum to zero. But now in chapter four, we're going to introduce an external force. Doesn't matter in some sense which one I make movable, but let's pretend I have my spring. And I'm using mass spring system as an example of how to do this. I could do this with constants M, B, and K that are not positive only. But in the damped harmonic oscillator, yes, M, B, and K are positive numbers. Damper like a bicycle pump. But now this left-hand wall is not fixed, it's movable. So I could apply a force. This F of T has various names. Some people call it an input. Some people call it a forcing function. For scene function. But it's something that I not just moves to the right, I could pump the system left, right, up, down. And this gives me a new differential equation. Well, right now, left, right. Let's forget about the up, down for a second. Only one dimension of motion here. So this is a this is the same picture I drew last time. Damped, but I need to put the context together. Harmonic oscillator. And this is a forced damped harmonic. oscillator. And I use the damped harmonic oscillator, KMB, KMB, all KM and B positive, because I want to bring your physical intuition into the problem. What would this be like? Let me give you an analogy of what this would be like. Let's say you have a aquarium or a tank or a bucket and this bucket is filled with a kind of a thick oil you know let's just say some generic relatively heavy motor oil in the aquarium and then this is you I'm worse at drawing people <laughs> and cars this is you with a slinky on your very long arm. And the slinky is attached to a mass. And the mass is sitting in the motor oil. 
is sitting in the aquarium with the motor oil and the stiffness of the spring is K. Well, what does the aquarium full of motor oil act like? It acts like damping. And now I want you to imagine with your very long but tiny arm that you pump this slinky up and down. I even have a video that's a little bit like this on the website, but watch what happens to the mass. You fit in this why I want to use your physical intuition. You know what happens to the mass. As I have my thing pumped down, then the mass falls down. But I yank my hand up or I drag my hand up. The mass doesn't go up with me, right? Because of the motor oil, because of the damping, I pull up and then the mass comes up. I pull up, elongate the string, the spring, then the spring fights back and raises the mass. So there's a delay. Pump down, delay, pull up, delay. Now, I don't think I could do this with two hands because I'm not that coordinated. Yeah, see, I'm not that coordinated. But I'm trying to show you that what happens to the mass, it imitates the motion of your hand and it lags the motion of your hand. So this is an important concept. The motion of the mass both imitates, your hand goes up, down, the mass goes up, down. And lags, that means it's a little bit behind, imitates and lags the motion of your hand. What is your hand? Your hand is the driver. Your hand is the F of T. Your hand is the movable wall that you're pushing on with your arm muscles. So that is an image or an analogy of what a force damped harmonic oscillator could look like. It could look like other things too, but that's an example, okay? So now let's try this out. Let's take this for a test drive with a couple of interesting forcing functions. And I'm gonna be generic at first. So I'm not gonna specify the M, the B, or the K. But let's take this for a test drive with a handful of forcing fun functions. Let's let the first forcing function be a constant. And here's a very simple example. Y double prime plus two Y prime plus five Y equals 10. That's what I mean by forcing functions constant. Well, by analogy with the first chapter, you did solve problems like this. You said, here's a non-homogeneous problem. Here's the homogeneous problem. And what I'm doing is relating to you that handout that I showed you last time with the flow chart of solving these. So here's the homogeneous problem. Here's the non-homogeneous problem. You could write a solution to the homogeneous problem. Now, I'm just gonna write one for you. Because when I look at these constants, I can see the characteristic equation. I can see the roots. If it takes practice, you can probably see them too. And what I have here is complex roots. So I have damped harmonic oscillation, under damped. The roots are minus one plus or minus two i. So for star, I have a homogeneous function, solution k1. E minus T equals 2T and K2 E minus T sine 2T. 
And what was my mission in chapter one? To find one more solution, excuse me, I advanced the paper, to find one more solution, one particular solution to double star. And with a particular solution to double star, then I can combine them to make the general solution to my problem. But now let's think about logically what the solution YP could be. And I get this imitates and lags idea coming back to help me. This is the driving force. In my bucket example up here, it's as if I just smashed my hand down or smashed my hand up, just drove, drove the system with a constant force. Well, how's the mass gonna respond? If I'm pushing down with a constant force, the mass will go down constantly, eventually constantly, until it reaches the bottom of the tank. Let's say we got a very large tank. Or if I raise my hand up constantly, the mass will take a second to realize it because the spring's got to recover, but the mass will start to rise up. It could be the speed at which my hand moves is faster than the speed at which the mass moves. That's a possibility, right? Because the oil is slowing it down. But what could this YP be? What I want to say to you is, and this is the most hated word in all the mathematics courses, it's obvious that YP is two. You say that's ridiculous. How can you say that that's obvious? Well, first of all, let's check to see if it works. Second derivative of two is zero. First derivative of two is zero. Multiply by two, you get zero. Five times two is 10. Winner. But how did I know it was two? I use the imitate idea. The YP has to imitate the driving function. If the driving function is a constant, the YP has to be a constant. And then I only needed to search for an appropriate constant. And since constants contribute nothing to the derivatives, the appropriate constant was gonna be the constant that solved the equation five Y equals 10. I got the answer. I got my YH, I got my YP, I glue them together. And right now, okay, I was gonna say, I don't wanna take the time to write it, but that's not very fair. I glue them together and I have my generic solution for the motion of this mass and that oil when I'm only pushing down or pulling up. I haven't specified that Y direction is up or down. Let's say up is positive. Now, with the K1 and K2, I have to use initial conditions. Like, was this mass initially at the equilibrium line in the tank? And was the mass not moving? You know, I don't know about that. I haven't specified the conditions. K1 and K2 specified by initial condition. Remember the handout? But before I show you an animation, before, and there's some movies on my website you should definitely check out in here. Maybe I'll have to point one out to you. But let's think about the forcing functions. The first time you do this constant forcing function, you feel proud. You think that's cool. I solved an equation in my head. But then, you know, after you've done this several times, you're not so impressed anymore. So what do you gotta do? Say, okay, I wanna try out some other forcing functions. How about a line? How about a parabola? How about any polynomial? No problem. I just make my YP into a line, a generic parabola or any polynomial. That's the method of undetermined coefficients, AT plus B. 
AT squared plus BT plus C, AT cubed, whatever, polynomial I got, ATN stuff. Full polynomial, coefficient for every power. And then you're gonna find, it's not so obvious as this too, but by substituting this YP with the undetermined coefficients into the problem, you'll be able to find the ABC. <coughs> That's gonna take some systems of two equations, two unknowns, three equations, three unknowns may be worse, but you can find the A, B, and C. This is the method of undetermined coefficients. And then you found your particular solution. By the way, I give you some vocabulary here, which we might emphasize next time a little harder. The particular solution is what? It is the response to the forcing of 10. So some people call the particular solution or a particular solution, the forced response. It is the forced response of the system, the system's response when you forced it. And then what should we call the YH? The YH was the response of the system before I forced it. No forcing, right? So some people call this the free response. So you just hear different vocabularies. Some people call it the unforced response. Some people call it the natural response. So be open to different words, but they're presented in the book. So what I'm gonna do throughout chapter four now, what we're going to do throughout chapter four is pump up these forcing functions. Constant forcing function, boring. Well, useful, actually useful, but not exciting. Line parabola polynomial, okay, they can happen. Exponential forcing function. That's on your homework. So if this was an exponential curve like 10 e to the t or 10 e to the minus t, that would be a forcing function that's diminishing or growing. Same program, you just set yp equal to a copy a undetermined copy of an exponential with the appropriate exponent. And you can find out what the forced response will be. Because if this is 10 e to the minus t, then the response has to be based on e to the minus t. Same as if the forcing function was sinusoidal or periodic. Let's just say sinusoidal first made out of sines and cosines, but it could be any periodic function, right? Well, then your response will be periodic. And that's what I illustrated to you when I said your hand is waving the mass up and down in the tank of oil. I don't think I can do this. Push down, mass goes down, pull up, mass goes up. See your mass imitates and lags the motion of your hand. That's not a very good physical demonstration because it happens a little more smoothly than that. Okay, now I want to show you in just last minute, some visuals of this. Now, what we're gonna do is try forcing functions get harder and harder and harder. Well, okay, not, not 10 more, right? Maybe a couple more that are harder than this. And the, gold standard is discontinuous forcing functions. And for that, I need the weapon from chapter six, the Laplace transform. Discontinuous function. What if your hand is sitting there and I take a boxing glove and go smack, 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 smack smack, smack, and let your hand return to equilibrium. That is called an impulse, right? When I strike your hand for a very short instant, I apply a tremendous force to your hand, which affects the mass. Uh, kind of like a lightning strike on an electrical circuit or an electrical grid. 
or kind of like a bat hitting a baseball. Baseball is flying through the air quite predictably. A little bit of curve on it, a little bit of tacky spider tech stuff. Don't ask me, I'm not involved in any of that stuff. But then the batter swings and makes contact with the ball, if he can. And the ball radically changes its acceleration. Why? Because a force was applied to the ball, but only for a split second. After the bat strikes the ball just for a split second, it's no longer in contact with the ball. The bat supplied an impulse, a very extreme discontinuous driving function. Okay, what I wanna do is quickly run through one notebook for you. And that's here, and what is the name of it? Force, 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 driving function awareness. So to try to make this a little more visual for you, let me open up one more Mathematica notebook, share it with you, and let you see some visuals. Okay got the mathematics notebook in front of you. It's readable. Okay. So what I've done here is I've just put down a small collection of driving functions. Constant, line, parabola, sine. This one right here is a discontinuous driving function. We're not there yet. But then you can select what happens. And let's let the driving function be F1, the constant. So I'll execute the driving function, and then I'll execute a simple equation. Do you see that this simple equation is just the exponential decay equation? It's only a first order equation, not a second order. We'll do some examples next time. But let's take simple exponential decay with a constant driver. You've already solved this in chapter one, but now let's see it. Yes, here's the constant driver, it's three. And what does your solution want to do? It wants to imitate three. It has to catch up. Your solution in red matches the slope field and it's doing what? Imitating and lagging the driving function. Let's try another. Let's say I make this into F2, the line, and then execute the image again. New slope field, new solution. There's my driving function in black. And my red function following the slope field is a solution. It is imitating the line and it is lagging. You say, what do you mean it's lagging? It's below, that's not lagging. No, remember the horizontal axis is the time axis. So where the black line had a value at one time, the red line has a value what? Later. Lagging is this horizontal separation. Try it again. Now I'm doing this on a very simple equation, exponential decay, right? So not expecting big fireworks. Here's my driving function as a parabola. Here's my solution imitating and lagging the parabola. It does not have to have the same slope. It does not have to be the same parabola. Even the previous line doesn't have to be the same. But there is always, in the case like this, of decay or energy being taken out, exponential decay, there's always an imitation and lagging. Well, I can say that in other cases too. Let's do the sinusoidal one. Here, my sinusoidal forcing, this is like my hand pumping that mass in the tank of oil. And here is the red solution for how the mass moves. Do you notice the magnitude of oscillation of the mass in the tank of oil is smaller than the magnitude of the oscillation of my hand. Because the mass is not gonna wave up and down as much. By the time I change direction, the mass has to start going the other way. So the oscillation, the amplitude of the mass oscillation is less than the amplitude of my hand oscillation. I know that because I'm having to drag that stupid mass up and down in the oil. Let me do one more. Let's do the F5, which is the discontinuous driving function. I can only show you what the picture looks like. It is zero and my solution rises to imitate it. And then it becomes two 
takes a big jump and what happens? My solution rises to imitate it. Now we're not ready to discuss this really until chapter six, but we did do examples like this when we talked about saving money in your IRA and then spending it. That's a change. That's a discontinuous change. So you can go back and revisit those problems. Okay, you've been patient. I hope I planted a lot of seeds in your mind with these images. So I plant in your mind the seeds with these images. And now we're gonna back it up tomorrow and the following days with the math that confirms our intuition. It confirms what we observe. Do you understand when you do this tank of oil experiment? You know exactly how the mass is going to move. But now you're going to know the mathematical equations for how the mass is going to move. And not that anyone at uh, Dow Chemical or Ford Motor Company is going to pay you big bucks to pump a mass in a vat of oil but they are gonna pay you big bucks to understand vibrations, possibly. I hope they do pay you good. So this is the key to understanding vibrations. Okay, I'm gonna turn off the recording and wrap up things, get things recorded, posted, if you want to hang out and ask questions.